Amen. Don't you love the book of Daniel? Great, great book. I'm going to preach a message this afternoon. I mentioned to some of you all a while back that I was thinking about preaching this, and I decided this. it was fitting right now to preach this, How to Be a Rebel. How to Be a Rebel. Sounds like a good title, doesn't it? I uh, Probably a year ago, something maybe, maybe longer than that, I'm not sure, I was sitting at my computer, and I was typing out a message, and my wife came, you know, when she comes in, a lot of times she'll come, give me a kiss or something. Oh, isn't that sweet? Okay. And she'll, <laughs> she'll come in there. And so she reached down to give me a kiss. And she looked over my shoulder and saw my, my sermon title that I was preparing. And it said, How to Be Poor. And she's like, Well, I'm glad you got high aspirations. <laughs> right? And then it wasn't too long later, I preached another message. It was like, How to Be a Loser. And so she's like, Well, there we go. <laughs> my husband wants to be a poor loser. And so tonight you might get, or this afternoon you might get excited. How to be a rebel? Yeah. <laughs> well, I hope I don't disappoint you too too much. <laughs> but just think about the uh, that title of being a rebel, that position, having that kind of a, a of a of a title, the romanticism behind it. There's a certain romance behind being the rebel, isn't there? I mean, let's be honest. I remember as a high schooler being the kind of good good boy, goody two-shoes, and people saying, man, you know, the girls don't like guys like that. They like the bad guys. They like the rebels. <laughs> I remember actually thinking about that. Do I need to be a bad guy to be able to get the attention of some girls? But it's not that they want bad guys. It's this, this idea of being a rebel is something that's empowering. It's like it's attractive. Somebody is rebelling against the system. And the 50s, I think it was the 50s, a movie came out called Rebel Without a Cause. Anybody familiar with that at all? Never saw it or anything like that? But there's an iconic figure, uh, a picture in there where the guy, something Dean, I can't even think of it. What's his first name? Anybody? James Dean. And he's got jeans on and he's got a white t-shirt. And he was like the first one to kind of make that popular, I guess. Cigarette hanging out of his mouth. And he was a rebel without a cause. And the, the society just embraced that and said, oh, the rebels and the Beatles and all the rock and roll icons, legends of the day. People thought, man, these, I mean, really, if you think about it, rock and roll in itself is rebel. I mean, it's, 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 it's a rebellious in nature, the way they act. Uh, even this, it's interesting, if you study music, you'll find that even in the way that they put the music together, syncopation and all these things that kind of break the rules of traditional music. Art is the same way. Uh, I, I studied art for a long time, even thought about going to Kansas City Art Institute. Praise the Lord I didn't go because there's some real weirdos out there, man. <laughs> but at that time, I was studying the arts and all that, and I realized right away, like, all these artists want to be rebels. And I thought about even the type of painting that they all liked. It was like this, this modern contemporary art that was supposed to break all the rules of, of the traditional art, you know, where you actually know what it is when you look at it. <laughs> break all the rules. Like, ah, oh, a little kid could do that. No, he can't, because if you look here at the symbolism here of this dot over there and you compare it to this, and, and it's like this intellectual mumbo-jumbo, <laughs> and it, what it is is this mindset of rebelling, right? And it's this rebellious attitude, and it's something... Uh, that is romantic about it, romantic in the sense of, of it's just it's, it's exciting. It's something that you want to do. And, uh, man, whether it's the rock and roll culture of the day, the hip-hop, pretty much anything that's popular, it's going to have to do with what they claim to be rebellion. Now, what's interesting is most people don't really know they're not really rebelling. Usually they're just going along with what the trends are and what everyone else is doing, and that's not really rebellious at all, right? But they, they think uh, that they're being rebellious because it's popular, it's fun to do. And in fact, even in school, we're taught, if you read your history books, story upon story upon story. In fact, pretty much every story that makes the history books is a story of somebody rebelling, right? We don't need to be under that king. Let's rise up against him. And all these wars and all that have to do with uh, uh, somebody who was rebelling. And so because of all this, and it's popular in their history books, and it's what gets your name out there, and it's what uh, uh, is just romantic and gets you attention, popularity, all that kind of stuff, it's even popular 
maybe even in some ways very popular in independent Baptist circles. <laughs> if you haven't noticed that, one of the things we thrive on, well, we're independent Baptists, you know, and, uh, and, and we're going to rebel against the, the mainstream, uh, you know, and, and, and don't get ahead of me, but there's some things in the mainstream that needs to be rebelled against, okay? But so the, the title is How to Be a Rebel. How to Be a Rebel. Now, recently, uh, there has been some division among, you know, guys that keep the doors open at church during this time and guys that, uh, you know, close it down or go to live streaming only or go to uh, drive in, you know, and there's this kind of division. I think it's kind of weird that everybody wants to just, you know, care so much about what the other churches are doing. <laughs> but there's kind of a, a, this thing, and, and, and some people, I think, have looked at, you know, my decision, which, you know, our crowds are pretty small, so it's not like I have a major, <laughs> you know, dilemma. But uh, my decision to just keep the doors open, some said, that's irresponsible, and you're just trying to be a rebel and all this kind of, uh, of stuff. And so you might ask, well, since you took that stand uh, during this time, you know, the coronavirus and all this uh, uh, stuff, uh, you took a stand to keep the doors open and you've expressed how much you don't agree with what's going on and you don't buy into all the media's, uh, uh, the, what they post and everything. Are you going to get involved in this protesting that's going on right now? Apparently, every, pretty much every state, I think, right now has some sort of protest where the way I look at it, people just get antsy. They're tired of staying at home. <laughs> and I'm, at first, it was kind of fun, get to stay home, get to do something new. And then now it's kind of like, hey, man, I got to get to work. You know, I can't get along with my family. <laughs> the bills are piling up and they're getting antsy. That's, what, that's the way I look at it. And so they go out there and say, that's it. Let's rally. Let's get the government to, uh, you know, open everything back up. And so we're protesting and all this, and people are jumping on that bandwagon. I don't know the, the hearts of everyone doing that. And let me say this. Number one, there is something within me, and maybe within most men, I don't know, but something within me that has a little bit of a rebellious nature. There really is. That's how I actually got my wife to marry me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> something that has a little bit of a rebellious nature. And there's something about me that doesn't want anything to do with the lockdown and social distancing and all that kind of stuff. I reject it. You know, there's a lot. There's something within me that I'm talking about not a godly thing. Even just something that just in my flesh as a man, don't want to be told what to do, all this kind of stuff that has a rebellious nature towards this. And, uh, and quite honestly, that's not the only thing. I don't like wearing seatbelts. <laughs> I, don't, uh, I don't like following all the speed limit signs. There's something within me that doesn't like that. I don't like the fact that they require fishing licenses. Amen. <laughs> I don't like to pay taxes. <laughs> There's something within me that says, man, I love the protesting. Get out there, show the country, I mean, show the governors and all. You're not going to tell us what to do. We're going to open up and all that kind of stuff. And let me just add this in case you're saying, okay, where's the butt coming, you know? But let me add this. Hey, if you want to go out there and express your, if you're patriotic and you say, hey, I love my country and I want to stand up for our freedoms and I'm thinking about future generations and all that, I'm not going to stop you from doing that. My, purpose, my, my personal opinion on that, however, yes, we have the Constitution, yes, voting, yes, doing what we can to stand up for our liberty and all that. But you know what? I'm convinced more and more all the time as I read my Bible and I think about end times coming and all that, I'm just a pilgrim and a stranger in this land. You know, I'm not, politics is not my thing. It's not really that super important to me. Uh, do I love liberty? Yes. Do I like being an American? Well, in many ways I do. But ultimately, I've just got my eyes on Jesus, and I know that the world hate, hated Jesus. They're going to hate us. You know, there's going to be uh, uh, a lot of things that we don't agree with, no matter what. No matter what, how much we fight, there's going to be something else. What's most important is what we do uh, for the Lord. Now, obviously, some of our favorite stories in the Bible are also acts of rebellion, okay? And so when we read that, we say, well, obviously there's a time to rebel, you know? And so the message this afternoon, I very much agree with that, but 
if we're going to rebel in a righteous manner, and there is such a thing as rebelling righteously, we must consider some important lessons from the Bible, okay? So number one, here's the question you've got to ask yourself, against whom am I rebelling? I said that right for the grammar Nazis. Against whom am I dwelling? Don't worry, I'll get it wrong here in a minute. <laughs> All right, you'd better be sure if there's any rebellion in your heart, anything that says I'm going to rebel against the system, rebel against certain individual or whatever, you better be sure you're not rebelling against God. Okay? And you say, what are you talking about, rebelling against God? Well, sometimes some things are going to be put into place, uh, and we will naturally think, man, I've got to rebel against that. But if you really stop and consider what God's doing, you could find out that this is exactly what God wants. And rebelling against that, even though it seems to be your natural tendency, what, you, what your flesh wants to do is actually going against God. And I'll show you a few things on that. Look at 1 Samuel. <clears throat> 1 Samuel chapter 15. Verse Samuel 15, Samuel also said unto Saul, The Lord sent me to anoint thee to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore hearken thou unto the voice of the words of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, I remember that which Amalek did to Israel, how he laid wait for him in the way when he came up from Egypt. Now go and smite Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and spare them not, but slay both man and woman, infant and suckling, ox and sheep, camel and ass. And so that's some pretty harsh instructions given right there back in, in that day. But look at verse 9 here. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the oxen and of the fatlings and the lambs and all that was good and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse. Uh, that, they, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, It repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. And it grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. Look down at uh, verse 23. So obviously Samuel goes to Saul and said, What are you doing? You were told to destroy all of them. Why didn't you destroy them? And of course, uh, Saul says, no, this is a good thing that I did. Uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't obey because, uh, let's look at verse 20. And Saul said unto Samuel, yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way of the, uh, that the, which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag the king of Amalek and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil sheep and oxen and chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. He says, no, you don't, you don't understand. Like, I, I'm doing good for the Lord. And so we need to, to keep these. These are good animals. We can sacrifice them to the Lord and make him happy. And in verse 23 says, or verse 22, And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as the iniquity, as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee, from being king. Now I'll show you some other places where God uh, uh, says something very similar. But here's the idea. Saul thought, well, I can obey God, but I'll do it my way. And he decided I'm going to do it this way. And, and, and every time I read the story, I think about this time. It was never more clear to me than whenever I was arguing with somebody. Uh, what it was, let me just tell you the background story. I was preaching in a Sunday school class with young people, and we were addressing some, some things because they had never heard some of the things like why women shouldn't be pastors, uh, you know, what's this thing about women not wearing pants, what's this thing about uh, uh, should Baptists dance. I mean, there's all these kinds of things that were brought up, and I was like, well, let's just handle these areas one at a time. And, you know, most of, most of my advice to them was like, well, let's stop and think, why do you want to do that? Why do you want to do these things? What's the motive behind it? And one of them, we came to tattoos. 
And I said, well, what's the Bible say about tattoos? There's not a whole lot on that, but I took them to Leviticus, not to make any cuttings or marks in your body. And I said, you know, not only that, but there's a sense of rebellion. And if you think about what people are doing in the culture that have tattoos, and I was just preaching that. I wasn't trying to be ugly or tearing down anybody that has a tattoo just because they have a tattoo because of something they did in the past. I was just saying, here's my stand on that. Here's what the Bible says. And so some kid went home, told their parents that I had preached on that. And, of course, her mom had tattoos all over. And so she gets on Facebook. Oh, that's embarrassing. Hi, Tommy McMurtry. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you come from? <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> I got a preacher in my pocket. So uh, anyway, uh, so this lady says, I heard you were telling my kids that my tattoos are wrong, which I never mentioned her at all, right? I said, I uh, tried to be real nice back to her. And I said, look, I, I didn't say that. I was just showing from a biblical perspective, uh, you know, what's wrong with that. And I'm not judging anybody who's made that kind of, uh, uh, you know, decision in the past. And she said, well, you don't understand. She said, all my tattoos are for a purpose, and each of them represent some spiritual time in my life where some decision was made for the Lord. And so this decision, this tattoo represents when I got saved, this tattoo represents this or that. And she was saying all these things, and I was like, well, that's great that you feel like you're doing something for the Lord. I said, but the Bible says to obey is better than sacrifice. What are you, oh, I'm, you don't understand, I've got a mark up my body and cause all this stuff so that I, I, for the Lord, I'm doing it for the Lord. No, no, he's not interested in that kind of a sacrifice. Amen. He's not interested in that kind of a thing. He, he is interested in you obeying what he says to do. Amen. And so somebody that would try to say, you know, uh, well, you don't understand. I got to do it this way. This is the best way. I know what's best but they don't really have the right motivation in mind, you know, or, or they're, they're rebelling against the wrong person, then, uh, then they are doing much destruction to themselves. And look how serious God, you know, took, took this rebellion. Sometimes God wants us to do things that naturally we feel like we want to rebel against. Think about this. We just read about Daniel, uh, or actually Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Before that, we see where Daniel had to rebel and not and refuse to eat the king's meat. And, and then we're going to read more stories where Daniel's going to end up being thrown into the lion's den. All these were acts of rebellion that they were getting punished for, and God was sparing them from it. So a lot of people say, yeah, but look at Daniel. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You know? Look at these stories in the Bible of these men that defied the government, and they defied the instructions that were given to them right? And became great heroes of the faith. And I say, praise the Lord. I like those stories. But there's a few things that people are overlooking whenever they read that story. Look at 2 Kings 24. 2 Kings 24. This is the story where the children of Israel are turned over to captivity. Uh, Babylon, uh, uh, Babylon, King Nebuchadnezzar, is actually, God actually calls him his servant. And he says, I'm sending him to, uh, to take the, these people in, in captivity, the Jews in captivity. And in his days, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up and Jeho Jehoiakim became his servant three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. And the Lord sent again him bands of the Chaldees and bands of the Syrians and bands of the Moabites and bands of the children of Am Ammon and uh, sent them against Judah to destroy it according to the word of the Lord, which he spake by his servants and the prophets. To read Jeremiah, Ezekiel, all these, God was telling them clearly, this is what's going to happen. Don't rebel against it. This is my hand coming against you. Surely at the commandment of the Lord came this upon Judah to remove them out of his sight for the sins of Manasseh according to all that he did. And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood which the Lord would not pardon. All right, he goes on and talks about Jehoiakim and uh, Jehoiakin. And then it talks about uh, as we get down into uh, look at verse, uh, let's see, 17. And the king of Babylon made Mataniah, his father's brother, king in his stead and changed his name to Zedekiah. Then you follow the uh, Zedekiah. He was put as a vassal king over that, that 
over the uh, over Jerusalem, basically, and he was put there, and and uh, and he decided, hey, we're going to secretly go against this. I mean, we're God's people after all, and we shouldn't have anybody come in here and take us over into captivity, right? That's an insult to God. We need to rally up and we need to do something about this. Is basically his attitude. Now look at uh, verse. Look at chapter twenty-five. Look at verse 5. And the army of the Chaldees pursued after the king, and this time what King Zedekiah, overtook him in the plains of Jer Jericho, and all his arm armies were scattered from him. So they took the king and brought him up to the king of Babylon, to Riblah, and they gave judgment upon him. And they slew the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes, and put out his, the eyes of Zedekiah, and bound him with fetters and brass, and carried him to Babylon. Can you imagine? I mean, that's one of the worst things. They kill your family in front of you, and then poke out your eyes so that's the last thing that you ever saw, and then lead you away in fetters to captivity in Babylon. How did that re rebellion go? <laughs> and God made it clear over and over. He said, you're not rebelling against Nebuchadnezzar. You're not rebelling against Babylon. You're rebelling against me. I'm the one that said by the prophets, this has got to happen, and this is going to happen. And you rebelled against that, and, th and that's what happened. So what's that got to do with Daniel? Look at uh, 2 Kings 20. 2 Kings 20. This was the prophecy. Before any of this took place, the prophets were saying it was going to happen. We just read that where he says, the, you know, according to the words of the Lord through the prophets. 2 Kings 25, look at verse, um, I'm sorry, 2 Kings 20, verse 18. And of thy sons that shall issue from thee, which thou shalt beget, shall they take away, and they shall be eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. Now let's go to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1, verse 3, And the king spake unto Ashpenaz, the master of his eunuchs, that he should bring certain of the children of Israel, and of the king's seed, and of the princes, children in whom was no blemish, but well favored, and skillful in all wisdom, and cunning in knowledge, and understanding science, and such as had ability in them to stand in the king's palace, uh, and whom they might teach the learning of the tongue of the Chaldeans. And so, when you begin reading that story, put two and two together, read back to the prophecies, they said they're going to take your children into Babylon and make them eunuchs. And now here's a guy working underneath the eunuchs, you know, the, the prince of the eunuchs there, so that they could work in the palace. And so this was something that they would do so that the so that the, uh, the men that were working in the palace there wouldn't be distracted uh, with relationships and stuff like that. They made them into eunuchs, and they kept them there as servants. Now, I'm not saying that that was a good thing or something that shouldn't have been, you know, uh, uh, avoided or that Daniel should have tried to stop, but you see no stories in here where Daniel fought against that, <laughs> didn't fight against being carried into captivity, didn't fight against any of the things, the measures that the... Uh, uh, the government put upon him at that time. Why? Because God had said, this is going to happen. They're going to carry you guys away. They're going to take you into captivity. Don't you rebel against that because that's my hand upon you for this time. <clears throat> I have found that oftentimes people want to be like Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but I bet you they don't want to actually go through the things that they went through. <laughs> they don't really want to see this nation destroyed they just want to be able to rebel in, in the good times, you know, and, and, uh, and come out as a, as a hero and all that. I found that often a godly rebellion isn't received as well as an ungodly rebellion. <laughs> when somebody really stands up for what's right, and this is what God wants, uh, that's usually not so popular. What's popular is when they do something in rebellious nature that's actually ungodly and unrighteous. Then all of a sudden, hey, that gets a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of attention. You want to make all your Christian friends upset? Tell them you're not voting for Donald Trump. <laughs> That'll make people upset real fast, right? Now, I'm not voting for Donald Trump. And here's the funny thing about that. Most people that love Donald Trump, you know what they love about him? He's a rebel. <laughs> 
he gets up there, he doesn't take any flack, you know, and he's, he's just got this re rebellious personality. You think about him, uh, uh, you know, and sun, uh, you see the little smiley face with the sunglasses, <laughs> you know, yeah, that's my president, right? I know not, you guys don't feel that way, but I'm just saying this is what a lot of Baptists feel like. Man, yeah, Trump, man, let them have it. Let that media have it and all that, right? Now, I, I understand Trump is the president. I'm just saying you want to make people mad, say, you know what? I'm not going to vote for him. They'll say, oh, what in the world? You're just trying to be a rebel. <laughs> yeah, well, I think that he stands for some things that aren't very godly. I don't think he's a good man. How in the world? Don't you know? Lesser of two evils. Don't you know? If you don't vote for him, then you're voting for Hillary Clinton. That's what I heard last uh, elections, right? And I'm thinking, well, how? okay, first of all, I'm not voting for Hillary Clinton. So not voting for Trump's not voting for Hillary Clinton. <laughs> I, I didn't vote for either one of them. So I said, well, then you can't complain if we get Hillary Clinton. How do you know God doesn't, didn't want us to have Hillary Clinton? <laughs> Yeah, well, she'll lead this nation into, you know, just the worst economic times of, uh, you know, we ever had. Well, I mean, I'm just saying that could very well be happening here pretty soon with Trump as our president, <laughs> too, right? Because it doesn't matter who's in the office. It doesn't matter if it's Trump or Bernie Sanders <laughs> or whatever. God's in control, and, we, and he is our king. He is our leader. We're just pilgrims and strangers passing along on this, on this world. And so we look to Jesus. We look to the Bible. This is where I get my instructions. Okay? Yes, sir. But believe it or not, that's not popular. Being a rebel is popular. Standing up for the Bible, that's not popular. Man, you need to get with the program. <laughs> you need to get with the Fox Baptist, the Fox News Baptist. You need to get with You need to pick a team right here, but you can't just be a rebel. <laughs> you got to be a Republican or, or something, but you can't just... No, I, I really don't, don't think that I have a rebellious attitude on that. I've already mentioned to you and admitted to you, confessed my faults, that I do sometimes get in the flesh and like to be a rebel. Okay, But in this matter, that's not my motivation behind that. Which brings me to my second point. So first point was this, against whom are you rebelling? The second point would be this, what is your motivation for rebelling? What is the motivation? What are you rebelling? I'll tell you why most people want to rebel. Because, hey, I don't like that. <laughs> you can't tell me what to do. I don't, like, I don't like the options you're giving me, so I'm going to rebel. right? And that's usually why somebody rebels. Often, it's a mob mentality. It's a mob mentality. right? Well, everybody was just fine staying at home, and then all of a sudden, all the masses and the friends are going out there with picket signs saying, hey, free us. Let us go. So now all of a sudden, those people who just a while back didn't mind staying at home, now they're like, hey, I need to go join the... That's a mob mentality. And guess what? That's not really being a rebel anyway. <laughs> That's just following the masses. All right? So if you're going to make a decision based on what the masses are doing... That's ridiculous. I'm going, to re I'm going to be a rebel. What's everybody else doing? Let me see what I can rebel against. <laughs> that's, not re that's not being a rebel, right? It's certainly not being a, uh, a righteously being a rebel. But what's your motivation? Sometimes it's because the authority wants you to do something that you don't want to do. Like I said, at first, it seems like a lot. And I'm not really trying to make this about the, the coronavirus. I'm, I'm just using that as an example because that's where we are as a nation right now. <clears throat> But somebody will tell you, you know, hey, you need to stay home and, uh, and you need to, you know, just wait this out for a little while. So everybody says, hey, that's pretty cool. You know, we get to, you know, try to homeschool for a little while, get off work and try to try to make these things go. And all of a sudden it's like, I'm getting tired. You know, I don't want I don't want people telling me what to do anymore. So then all of a sudden, how can I rebel against the system? The real motivation behind that kind of thinking is, hey, I don't like people telling me to do something that I don't want to do. Well, you think Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you really think that they wanted to do the things that, that God was having them go through and to endure all that? Of course they didn't want to. The only godly motivation for rebellion is, uh, is that it, it, the, the only godly motivation for rebellion is this, Acts 5.29. We ought to obey God rather than men. We ought to obey God rather than men. So you have to really check your motives and say, is that really my motive? 
is that really what I'm trying to do, or do I just want to be a rebel, be popular with a certain crowd or something like that? The fact is we ought to obey God rather than man. What does he want us to do? In what, manner, in what manner are you rebelling? Okay, What is your attitude in your spirit towards rebellion? It is godly to submit. We don't like it, but it's godly to submit. God loves obedience. He loves people to be in subjection. He loves people to be subject to their authorities. Look at Colossians 3. Colossians chapter 3. We've all known this from the time we were kids. God wants children to be in subjection to and obey their parents. Amen. Not to be rebels against their parents. Right. So, well, what if my parent wants me to do something that's not fair? So, <laughs> obey your parents. Well, what if I don't like it? It seems like they hate me, giving me all these rules and all that stuff. Obey them. Honor them. Why? Because it's pleasing to the Lord, and that's what He wants you to do with your life right now. Colossians 3.20 says, uh, or uh, let me see here, yeah, Colossians 3.20 says, Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. It's godly. It pleases God for you to submit to your parents and obey them. Wives, the Bible says, verse 18, Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. You know? There's maybe a time where a husband could ask a wife to do something and she would say, I got to obey God rather than man. But look, most of the time when a wife just rebels against her husband because he's a doofus or makes some kind of bad mistake or something, nothing, I'm not, this isn't personalizing anything. <laughs> he does something and the wife a lot of times be like, well, I'm not going to follow that man. Hey, what's the Bible say? You're obeying God by following your following your husband. And so uh, when you obey him, then, uh, then you are actually honoring God. Now that one's not so bad. How about this? Bosses. We've got to be subject unto our bosses. Colossians chapter 3, verse 23. Uh, verse 22, actually. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart. Fearing God. In other words, don't just jump up when the boss is around and say, Oh, yes, boss, I'm doing what you asked me to do, boss. And then he leaves and you're like, Stupid boss. <laughs> I'm so tired of following that guy's order. No, no, no. Do it. If he told you to do something, do it. He doesn't even have to like, know you're doing it. You're just honoring him. And let me just say that I'm saying bosses, okay? Because I think an application can be made in the Bible to servants and masters. And you can say, Hey, we're servants to our masters, our bosses at the place we work. But let's go back into that time and, and think about how masters treated their, their servants back in those days. <laughs> you know, the things God's telling them to do and obeying their masters, it's, come on, it's not, they don't have the union to back them up. <laughs> they don't have, you know, well, I'm going to sue this company if you don't treat me fairly and, and uh, you looked at me wrong or, or women say, well, you didn't pay me fairly or you didn't, I mean, I mean back then it was like, hey, whatever the master says, that's what I got to do. And the Bible says over and over again, master, uh, servants obey them uh, in all things. Amen. Look at Hebrews. I personally think you all have a really uh, uh, easygoing pastor. But the Bible says you're supposed to obey your pastors. <laughs> if I wasn't so easy, if I got real harsh and said, hey, this is the way we're going to do things. The Bible has a good indication you're supposed to obey that. Amen. Hebrews 13, 17. In the context here, I, I think you can see he's talking about uh, uh, the church and the, and the govern, governing bodies in the church. And uh, Hebrews 13, 17 says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give, a, an, a, give account that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2. First Peter 2 says we're supposed to obey our governments. Oh, <gasps> but we're independent Baptists. <laughs> 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 11. 
Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, that's what we are, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against uh, the soul, having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, uh, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the kings as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God, that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. God doesn't like us to have a rebellious spirit and a rebellious attitude. Now, he does want us to obey him rather than and not to fear any man, but to fear him above everybody else and say, I'm willing to take what comes my way. You know, uh, look, here's the deal. If I don't wear my seatbelt, which I'm very likely not to do, <laughs> I'm probably going to get a ticket if I get caught one day or whatever or get into trouble or, you know, I get pulled over. They said, how come you didn't have your seatbelt on? Eh, I'm sorry, you know, I'm, I'm stupid. Here's your fine. Guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pay my fine because I had it coming to me, right? Better off if I just obey, <laughs> obey the law. But anyway, let's not get into that. Speed limit. I'm speeding. I see an officer down there. You know what I'm not going to do? I'm not going to thumb my nose at him. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to probably slow down, <laughs> make sure I'm obeying the, the speed limit, because I know that when he comes to the car, I'm not going to say, hey, yeah, well, I pay your salary. <laughs> Go eat a donut, cop. You ever hear that kind of an attitude among even independent Baptists? Like, come on, he's enforcing the law. You might not like the law. He's enforcing it. There comes a time where you have to say, no, I'm going to obey God rather than man. And again, if you're a patriot, vigilante, I'm going to, I'm just, you know, this is for America and I'm defending our rights and whatever. Well, you go right ahead, but I'm not of this world. Okay, I'm in this world, but I'm not of this world. I'm just a pilgrim passing along. I'm going to do my best to obey by their laws to some degree. <laughs> but here's the thing. See, I have no desire to steal. Why? Because I'm obeying God. And God says that that's wrong. I'm not going to go steal from anybody. So I'm not planning on getting arrested for stealing. I'm not planning on murdering anybody. I'm not planning on doing these kinds of things. If, if your motivation is, I just want to serve the Lord. I just want to do what pleases God, preach the gospel, win souls, edify the brothers, and all this kind of stuff. That's all I want to do. And if I'm trying to, you know, uh, uh, fight to that cause or something like that, God's going to bless it, you know. But that's a lot different than just saying, hey, I got to go out here and fight every cause and be a rebel in every situation and all that kind of stuff. That's not the attitude that we see of any good man in the Bible that we say, man, that's a great story, how he rebelled against the authorities and all that kind of stuff. Look at Daniel chapter 1 again. Daniel chapter 1. So this is right after, you know, not long after at least, uh, that the, ch the Hebrew children are taken there into captivity. And the story goes here, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portions of the king's meat, nor with the wine that he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. You see this attitude of him going to his authority and saying, Could you please allow me to get by and, 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 and pass over, not have to obey this command because it goes against what God uh, wants of me and what he's commanded us. Now, God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. Only a weirdo would try to read more into that than is there. He's just saying that this guy just really respected Daniel and uh, had great compassion for him. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord, the king, who hath appointed your meat and your drink, for why, uh, for why should he see your face worse likening than the children which are of your sort? Then shall, he make me in, uh, then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel to Melzar, 
whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech to thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance be looked upon before thee, and the, uh, uh, the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat. And as thou seest, deal with thy servants. So he consented to them in this matter, and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenances appeared fairer and fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Thus Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine uh, that they should drink and gave them pulse. As for these four children, God gave them knowledge and skill and all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding and all visions and dreams. Now at the end of the days, when the king had said he should bring them in, then the prince of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar, and the king communed with them. And among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And in all manner of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his realm. And Daniel continued even unto the first year of King Cyrus. What did he end up doing? Serving the king there. Uh, he was actually a servant to them, doing what he said. But in this matter, he asked him to do something that was ungodly. And he went to them with the right spirit, said, look, I would really rather not do this. I don't want to, f- <laughs> I mean, I'm reading between the lines, rather not fight you on this. You know, you get to chapter 3 and you see Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego saying, on this, we're not careful to answer you. You know, we're not bowing to any other God. You can do whatever you want. You know, God can spare me from it or he can let me, you know, let me die. But either way, I'm going to do what's right by God. But that's far different than saying, oh, yeah, (laughs) you know, come shut me up. (laughs) Come steal my guns. I mean, uh, all right, I just opened up another can of (laughs) wine. Oh, yeah, it's the spirit. See, the spirit is what is right in God's eyes. You know, if you're going to be a rebel and you're going to be a righteous rebel, you might have to consider, number one, am I rebelling against God? That's the most important thing. Number two, you need to consider what is the motive for you being a rebel? Number three, in what manner are you rebelling? And really, if you think about it this way, in, in terms of just reading the Bible and considering all that, really, there is no godly way to be a rebel. <laughs> because even when you rebel against government in order to obey God, you're not being a rebel. You're obeying God. <laughs> so there's really no, no place in a Christian's life to be a rebel. Let's go to 451 in your songbook.